there's probably two things that I know now about my childhood. Um, but what the one thing that I probably noticed the most, there was definitely like a, a kind of seasonal cyclical mood. Okay. So like in, um, in winter, I'd always be like really, really sick, like physically sick. Yeah. I'd always be like bedridden. I'd have like six weeks or a couple of months off school. I'd always have like the flu or glandular fever or some like form of like, I don't know, chest infection or some virus or something that just like wouldn't go away. So I'd always be like really sick in winter, but then come springtime, I'd always just be like full of energy and bubbly. And that was like my time of the year. I always knew that like kind of, well, springtime for us is like September. So sort of September through like December over summer, that was like, that was always when I achieved the most things. It always was like when I was the happiest. Um, and looking back now, I think that that's sort of like, a, it resembles like some bipolar kind of type mood swings to do, I think, with, um, you know, sunlight and, and things like that, that, that trigger different mood states. So for me, that was probably a really big one that I noticed because I still suffer those sort of like year long, really uh, large like mood swings. And I think they just got more and more extreme up until sort of about when I was like 20 years old, you yeah. know, those early, like um, late teens, uh, like early twenties was when I noticed the, the biggest um, change in those moods, but they followed the similar pattern. Um, something else that I probably noticed a lot was, The way that my family treated me had a lot, I think, to do with the type of adult I became in a lot, a lot of positive ways and also probably in a lot of negative ways. Um, you know, and there's so much to unpack there, but I was definitely, I was a classic overachiever, um, but there was sort of two parts where it's like I was the family scapegoat in like one section. Mm -hmm you know, and I was kind of the poster child. So it was like th this dichotomy of like good and bad or, or good versus evil. It's like, I was kind of like both in one. It was like extremes. It's like when I succeeded and I had an award and I sort of made everyone look good and they had something to talk or brag about. It's like, I was a really good person. I was a great person. You know, the sun shined out of my ass. <laughs> like yeah. I, I couldn't have been you know, a, a better daughter. Um, but then in other areas, I, I think I triggered a lot in, in my, in, in the people around me, I think. Um, so a lot of their anger towards me is probably anger that they were feeling towards themselves. But yeah, then you had this other flip side where it was just a lot of like verbal abuse, um, a lot of uh, like gaslighting type behaviors a lot of you know and and I think it's taken me a long time to really overcome that internal dialogue of you're worthless we wish you were never born you know you're not good enough like we hate you and things like that when you hear it day in day out um it's impossible to not be affected by that type of stuff how, how did that impact you when you were growing up how did you start to feel about yourself when when these kind of you were in this environment that was giving such conflicting messages about yourself I think somewhere deep down, I knew it wasn't true. But then also probably even deeper down, the seeds get sown where it's like you you fear so much that it is true. You know, I grew up really fearing that they were true, but also trying to prove them wrong. Yeah. Um, it was, I think, I don't think I learned my lesson in trying to prove them wrong like quite verbally you know like I would stand up for myself and I'll be like no you're wrong so then it just got into like really escalated arguments the older I got of where I would stand my ground and be like no you people are being unreasonable you know like um I mean I was a champion debater in, in growing up you know I was like state debating champion so it's like it's it's kind of like you really expected to have a child that was you know like obedient um you know when when they're a debater it's like I I was a but why child, but why? You know, like I, I'm not being uh, defiant. I'll do what you want me to do, but you need to provide a valid argument for that because, you know, I'm not going to do something just because you told me to do it. And yeah. I think, I, I think having quite authoritarian, um, like a parenting style with being quite, uh, I don't know what you would describe me as, but, but quite like an, an enlightened kind of open child, like intelligent child. 
um, that is sort of anti-authoritarian, not in a like, you know, stuff the police kind of way, but in a like, well, just because you're older than me doesn't mean that you're you know more on this particular topic, you know, like the, there's ins and outs and nothing is like black or white. Um, I think that's really frustrating for, for parents to actually grow up in. Um, and it's frustrating for children to grow up in as well, I guess. Like, um, you know, I, I don't blame them for anything. And I think I've just, you know, you just have to let go of stuff the older you get when you grow up, you know, yeah. <laughs> You're like they did the best they could. It's you know, you, I think you get to a certain age where you realize that your parents are just, just uh, stuffed up children too. Well, in your teenage years, what kind of behaviors um, did you exhibit when you were feeling like you were, you were being controlled and there was all this kind of frustration and anger and, and negative emotions? What kind of things would you do way back then to try and cope with all of this chaos that was going on for you? I internalized it a lot. Um, because I definitely was not a uh, rebellious teenager, despite that I was kind of labeled as one, you know, like I didn't drink, I didn't do drugs, you know, I didn't go out, I didn't sneak out to parties, like I didn't, I didn't do any of that stuff, you know, I was like a straight A student and, and um, so I didn't really exhibit, I guess, that the, those classic behaviors, probably not until a bit later in life. Um, but I did exhibit a lot of closed door behaviors, like, um, like self-harming. Yeah. But behind closed doors. Um, I, and, and a lot of, yeah, a lot of sort of internalizing, I think that that self hate, you know, I, I wrote a lot. But I think for me, um, I had the safe place of like school, like I loved school, you know, I, I had this escape where it was like, you know, my family would say that they hate me, but I would go to my friends' houses and their parents would tell their children, why can't you be more like B? <laughs> like, 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 you know, so it was sort of, I think I got a lot of that validation from outside of, of that family unit, which is probably why it was quite confusing for me as well, because it was like, well, you know, th this person, these people, like they, they think I'm a good person. Like, why can't you like the, the two people or even down to like the one person I probably wanted it from more than anyone else you know school there's so many ways to prove your worth and I put that in in air quotes you know especially if you're a classic overachiever it's like if you're on the debating team and then you're like the go-to public speaking person of the school and then you've got you, you know like there's just there's so many little competitions that are run it's like some some years I'd be like rarely at school because I'd be going to this competition at like the next school or the, the state or regional competition so it's like whilst you're getting that validation I definitely think that saved me I think my biggest downfall was when I left school um and you know I mean university I think wasn't that bad but even at university for me it was like a massive shock because it's like that is how I regulated myself so in the real world it's like oh well there's no competitions to win anymore. There's no ways for me to prove my worth. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, you know, I, I think in a way I was almost like addicted to that type of attention. So not having that type of attention really makes you go from like, yes, I'm super special to like, I'm nobody. And that's a super soul crushing reality, or at least that was like for me. <laughs> And what did you notice um, mood-wise at that time? And, and I'm also curious about um, actually getting a diagnosis. So after I left high school, I went to law school. Um, so I was studying at a Bond University, a, a Bachelor of Laws. And it was about two years into my degree that I started to notice like a massive different like shift in um, mood. And um, there were, a, like, I don't know whether it was specifically because of the, the, these sort of incidents that happened or prior to that, because I do know that I was quite depressed the first couple of semesters at university. Like, people said to me, like, oh, we've hardly ever seen you, you know, like, we didn't even realise that you went here. Um, but then we had, in, in the springtime, I went to my friend's house in uh, Perth, um, for the holidays and you know I started like weightlifting because she owned a gym and I came back off the holidays and you know all of a sudden I was in like a brighter mood it was like sunny that spring that happiness you know I was going out all the time and people were like wow you know like we had no idea that you even went here um 
but during that same time, um, my grandmother passed away, which I didn't really know her that well. So I don't think that was a massive trigger for me, um, but it was my last remaining grandparent. Um, and my best friend's mom passed away as well. And another friend of mine at university also passed away. But I think my best friend's mom was like the biggest one because I did live with her on and off throughout high school. So for me, she probably re represented that like mother figure yeah. that like, well, when your parents hate you, why don't you just come to my house and, you know, you can have love and acceptance and, and someone, an adult that's on your side. Oh. So for me, she was such a significant figure. And when she passed away really suddenly, th that was like a moment of, that could be like the defining moment of what you would call a mental breakdown, I guess. You know, I just didn't know what to do with myself. And I was in a really weird place where I was feeling these emotions. It was such a significant sort of pain, trauma, loss, you know, sense of grief that I felt, but I couldn't talk about it because people would be like, yeah, but it wasn't your mom. Yeah, but it was, you were grieving and you were suffering a huge bereavement and no one understood that I, because you, you can't really, it's not easy for a young person to, to articulate that and explain that that actually was a mother figure for you. Yeah. So, you know, and, and, you know, even then there's like a time limit on grief too, like a strange time limit, you know, it's like a, you know, a month later or something, people are like, oh, you're still upset about that? Like, <laughs> seriously, like get over it by now. And I think because I really had no one to grieve with because I was away at university as well. So I was away from like her family, you know, my best friend and all of that. So anyone that I knew that was grieving her as well was sort of so far away um, so yeah, for me, that was probably where I, I suffered my first manic episode looking back, um, you know, like not being able to sleep, um, racing thoughts, not being able to sit still. And that just, I guess eventually you end up to a form of like kind of delirium as well, because you're not sleeping. And, and there was really confusing times where I was stuck between a lot of like grief and kind of depression, but also like this um like anxiety kind of hyper mania hypermania like you know having both at the same time in this kind of mixed episode was was really strange and i think that's the most destructive because that's when you're feeling things really intensely and then you know you're, you're not you don't have that that break sign there's nothing going okay maybe we should think about and regulate your decisions you're really impulsive but then you've got these really you know intense negative desires yeah. And, and I think that's the moment where a lot of people kind of get pushed over the edge. So that for me was really difficult. It took me a long time to get a diagnosis though, because of that, because I, you know, I reached out for help quite early and, you know, people like, you know, reaching out for help you think is the big deal, but it's not answering the second follow-up question is the big deal where people then go like your doctor is like, okay, well, what's going on? And you're like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Like that is actually the scary question. It's not saying, you know, I'm not okay. Like that's the easy part. Once you get that out, trying to explain what's going on is the difficult part. And um, for me, I think a lot of that got hidden under, you know, this thing that had just happened to me, which was really traumatic, but also, you know, they're like, okay, well, that just means you just need therapy. You just need to kind of talk about it. But at the same time, my life was really spiraling out of control. I think on like a chemical you know, level as well. Um, and it probably had been for a while. This was just kind of like that trigger that just made everything go to super extremes in my brain. So, you know, that's when I started to get on, you know, things like antidepressants as well, or like they, they prescribed me sleeping pills, but even then they're like, you probably, you know, you just have like depression, anxiety, you just need to see a counselor. So then you see a counselor and then they're like, so tell me about your childhood. You're like, yeah, I had, I had a great childhood, you know? And then they're like, okay, right so tell me about your childhood yeah. and then eventually you're kind of like holy shit i had a messed up childhood like <laughs> yeah you know and then they're kind of like well no wonder you feel all of these terrible things like you know and you're like well i didn't feel bad about it until now you want to um get a sense of helping people understand what a manic episode is actually like so if you compare it to how you are when things are when you're doing well um can you kind of explain sort of what goes on for you both in your mind and also the behavioral stuff as well? Okay. Um, well, first of all, I should probably disclose that I've been diagnosed with bipolar 2, which is sort of the um, 
I don't want to say lesser version of bipolar, but it's slightly different. Bipolar 2 patients tend to have more depressive episodes and more of a hypermania, whereas bipolar 1 tend to have more of these manic episodes. And I think the real difference is like they are, um, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but, um, you know, the psychotic episodes. So I never specifically had a psychotic episode or suffered like psychosis. Yeah. It's been pretty close at times. Um, but I, I would probably say on a clinical level, I've suffered like a hypermania, which is a more mild form mm -hmm. of it, but it probably is still a sliding scale too. So it depends how high you go up. Um, and there's lots of other factors, but and for me, so much uh, one thing, more difficult to diagnose because it's not, it's not as obvious. It's not like you're gone into this super manic episode where it's really obvious that you're acting kind of completely out of character um so that that must have made it more difficult a hundred percent and it can be quite functional as well at times you know um up until you you know you sort of haven't slept in a couple of months and then you do start to get quite delirious but it can be quite functional when you need to sleep less so at first you know you, you need to sleep less so instead of needing eight hours you need like six and then you need like five and then you wake up after like four hours after three after two and you're just like oh you know like i'm awake i'm done it's like i've you know, had 10 coffees, but like, maybe I'm not jittery. I'm just alert. I'm super hyper, you know, like hyper focused, hyper vigilant, like things are like more colorful. It's like things start screaming at you it, at first in a really like pleasant way. You're like, Oh my God, like I've got lots of plants here. So it's like the plants would like sparkle and they'd be really um, like really defined. And it's like everything it's, you know, it's, it's kind of like, I don't know if any, any of your viewers have ever done like cocaine <laughs> yeah. or some form of like upper it's, it's can be very much like that. Um, you know, for me that kind of like, yes, well, but the trouble is it kind of doesn't like end very quickly. It, it just gets worse. So you think like, yes, being on top of my game is great. I, I need to sleep less. Um, you know, I, I can think super quickly. I'm super creative. I'm fearless. You know, just that, that impulse of like, you know, everyone wants a little bit of that impulse too. They want to be able to be like, Hey, maybe I should just do a cartwheel in the grass. That seems like a great idea. Yes, let's do that. And next minute you're like cartwheeling in the supermarket and <laughs> you know, um, your sort of filter, I think, uh, like for me, I start to know it's quite destructive when, um, like that social filter starts to like disappear. So I still have a level of awareness at times where I can see that I'm talking over people in my life, that I'm, um, I'm not being socially appropriate and I can see the way that people look at me. Um, and I'm like, okay, I need to like tone this down a bit, yeah. but also sometimes you just can't, it's like this word vomit, this like compulsive actions and words and thoughts it just like it need to be like rammed out of you and there's no like there's no filter and there's no control for that yeah. so you know that that's where it can start to get really destructive and then when the thoughts don't stop that for me is probably the most terrifying part where you haven't like sleep is great like for many reasons and it's mainly great because you can switch off that that mind as well so you don't have to think all the time but when you're pacing around you can't sit still you know, and it, it gets worse, you get more and more kind of ants in your pants and you're like agitated, you can't sit still, you sit down and then you got to get up and then you got to walk around and, and, and that kind of behavior, eventually you run out of things to do in your day. Yeah. And I know that like first manic episode, it, it went on probably, I probably escalated it too much by letting it go on because at university, you're allowed to like drink every day, you know, you're allowed to go out and party um, if you have different friendship groups, you can kind of be a social alcoholic because you just go find a different party to attend. Like I would go out like five nights a week with different people. So each, each group would go out like one night a week, but I'd be attending all five and kind of like no one really knew. Yeah. But eventually, you know, like you're in your dorm room by yourself, banging your head against the wall. Cause you're like, I want these thoughts to stop. I just want to go to sleep. And that is when it starts to get super you know, distressing because you realize that other people have, you know, schedules. It's fun at first, but everyone else then, you know, has a job and you've probably lost your job or you can't keep your job. And 
um, you know, you're pacing around your backyard in the middle of the night. And I think that's where your thoughts, you know, if they start to get kind of negative, then, then you're in really, really big trouble because you have this brain that's like on speed, that's like amped up and you don't necessarily have control of it. And, you know, whatever wants to come in, whatever stimuli is coming into your brain, it's like, yeah, it, it escalates pretty quickly at that point. Is the insomnia one of the worst parts for you? Is that one of the things that's the most difficult? Like if you could, can manage the sleep stuff, does it make everything else easier? I would say yes. Um, because, you know, when I, when I was, um, I, I took lithium for a while and, and that seemed to regulate like the, the hypermanic or sort of manic episodes um, a lot better where rather than like not needing to sleep or only sleeping like half an hour, an hour, you know, I could get like five nights sleep. And then that, that helps you keep touch with reality, you know, otherwise like your eyes, like, I don't know if people have ever stayed awake for such long periods of time, but it's like your eyes get so dry. <laughs> Really? Like your eyes are sore and you just want to close your eyes, but because time is going sort of so slowly for you because you're at another level of speed, it's like you close your eyes and you're like, surely that's been like an hour and it's been like, I don't know, a split second. Yeah. You know, it time passes differently. But I would say like in general, it's really hard to look at specific symptoms when you talk about complex mental illness or, or even something like bipolar I think the most devastating effects is on the long term um, you know because I'm, I'm hypermanic and even if it's not a destructive episode in itself I'm I'm like you know I've guaranteed I've changed my career plan you know I've like changed my job I've you know gotten rid of friends or I've done this and I've made all of these choices like these massive life decisions yeah. and then all of a sudden I you know I'm, I'm starting to go down or I get a depressive episode and it's it's like being two different people yeah living the same life you know when you come crashing down it's like you've you know you're cleaning up a party that you never attended yeah yeah so really the the decisions you you make your your thoughts all the time everything is so different when you're when you're in the manic stage compared to when things calm down again but when things calm down again it must be incredible it must really trigger a lot of depression and low mood because you then have to cope with the aftermath and and everything that's just happened yeah a hundred percent a hundred percent and I would say I would spend, you know, um, you know, like say nine, like, or before I was sort of properly treated, it'd be like nine months of the year would be depression. And then I would maybe have like a, a month or two of kind of a hypermania. And, you know, um, after that, you'd, there'd be like a transition period, like as you're coming down. But yeah, it's, I mean, the hardest bit, honestly, of, of all of it, if you're looking at the, the whole journey, is really, like, the fact that you're kind of elaborate, you know, like, you're trying to understand what's going on with yourself, you're trying to communicate that to, you know, I, I was, like, the poster child for, like, reaching for help, you know, the amount of therapists that I've seen, the amount of medications I've tried, you know, I, I, I would voluntarily check myself into the psych ward, and I've seen... I mean, I, I haven't actually sat down and calculated it, but I've seen five different psychiatrists, yeah. um, therapists. It would easily be somewhere close to like 20 different therapists, like ac actually like clinical psychologists that I've seen. Yeah. Um, and then had different social workers and things like that. Um, you know, for a while, I, I've had more than 15 different GPs, yeah. you know, generally which are like the first port of call for a lot of us here um, and it's like I just didn't get the answers that I wanted for for a long time I, re I really struggled to find people to help me um, and I at some point they kind of go oh you're a little bit too complicated for me now so um, we need to palm you off to someone who's more experienced but they're expensive or you know they're like sure you, you can come and see us but um, six months is the nearest appointment yeah yeah, it's, that's so difficult. I mean, I think it's amazing that you were so willing to seek help because it can be so difficult. And I really understand why people would not want to go to a stranger and put so much trust and confide in them in relation to 
their private lives and what's going on for them emotionally, particularly when it's it's such dark and difficult things. So um, I think it's amazing that you were so willing to do that. Um, but you must have also felt like you were kind of really kind of difficult. I mean, it sounds like they were kind of passing you around like a parcel and, and, and giving you this message that like they just didn't know how to help. And I think also like I fell into this really strange category. Like I know for a couple of years, my um I you know I found some good like doctors and therapists and everything and you know they were like oh uh, you know yeah you've got bipolar but you know the fact that you're still not okay it's probably like borderline personality disorder um like uh, as you can probably imagine from some of the stuff I described in my childhood you know so then they're like you you have to have dialectical behavioral therapy and it was all like um you know we're not going to change your medication we're not going to help you until you get dialectical behavioral therapy you need dbt yeah that's all i ever heard of everyone that i spoke to you need dbt mm -hmm. and i'm like fine get me dbt and there's only one place that offers it here and that's like the public hospital they do like a year-long course and mm -hmm. um you know i kept being referred there by numerous different doctors and they were like we're we're full we don't have space this you know th this intake and you know that went on for like two years i think i applied like six or seven times and in the end i, I called the head of the the dbt uh center there and and they just said oh my god like you again i was like yeah i need this dbt that everyone keeps telling me about they're like it's going to be life-changing like we won't touch your medication until you get dbt therapy and they were just like look honestly you're not sick enough to get this therapy you're never going to be admitted here did you uh, did you ever did you ever try dbt no, I wasn't able to get it um, because I wasn't being, so I'd been admitted into the private hospital, you know, but because I, you know, made sacrifices and paid for private health insurance, um, you know, and it basically came down to the fact that I wasn't presenting myself to the public psych ward or being taken there in a police car. Yeah. Um, I wasn't able to get the free public help at that point because I wasn't causing enough of a scene. And it was actually my, my psychiatrist at the private hospital that said, you just need to stop trying. You need to fully break down to be able to get the help that you need because you know, you're, you're like a highly functioning individual who's just keeping their head above water, but like you're functioning way less than your potential, but because you're not being a public nuisance, you fall through the cracks. Yeah. I want to um, ask about when you got your diagnosis of bipolar 2. And then also I want to get your thoughts on the fact that there was another diagnosis that was suggested of borderline personality disorder and just your opinion of your diagnosis. Um, because diagnosis is only helpful to help people get really good quality treatment. Otherwise, there's no reason to put labels on people. So, yeah, I just want to ask a little bit about that. So, first of all, the initial diagnosis of bipolar 2, when, what age were you when you got that? Uh, first of all, I just want to say I agree with you that um, like for me, a diagnosis is simply a ticket to treatment. Yeah. You know, so when people ask me, how do I feel about being labeled? I'm like, if they've got a call, they've got to say that I have bipolar to give me a mood stabilizer that's going to help me. Great. Like if they have to say that I've got borderline personality disorder to get this magical DBT therapy, you know, it's like, if that's what they need to diagnose me with to get the treatment, then that's, mm -hmm. that's, you know, I'm okay with that because ultimately I just want to be better, you yeah. know? So um, first of all, I was, it was 20 and it was uh, depression and anxiety. So they, they put me on some antidepressants for that. It was probably about another year and a half before I finally got referred to a psychiatrist. Um, I'd seen numerous GPs and I'd been seeing therapists like weekly um, for that year and a half. I got referred to a psychiatrist and um, they, they diagnosed me with bipolar. Um, so they took me off the antidepressants and they put me on some mood stabilizers to see how that went. I still really struggled for another couple of years um bouncing around gps and therapists and uh, they really wanted me to be admitted to hospital but i i was really reluctant to do that because i was quite terrified of it um but eventually when i did get admitted to hospital it was like one of the best decisions i ever made so i do highly highly recommend that i'm all for like early intervention i will check myself in 
um, bef you know, as I as I'm going down or, or when I when I'm really struggling, because hitting rock bottom is sort of too late to really seek treatment. Yeah. Um, you know, so being self aware is is massive in that. So, you know, I got diagnosed with bipolar. Um, then I went, I, when I was hospitalized, it was bipolar and generalized anxiety disorder. So they started treating me for both. Then uh, later on, they added uh, borderline personality disorder, which is because I'd gone through like a massive uh, traumatic breakup as well mm -hmm. at that time. Yeah. And then there had definitely been some, some borderline symptoms, but you know, I, w I was dating um, sort of a, a narcissistic, like quite manipulative person. Yeah. So, you know, when you have like all of your buttons on the table, I guess, and you're such an open person, you can quite easily be manipulated. So for me, it was it was almost like dating, you know, I'd, I'd found a match in my family and sort of trying to prove my worth to someone else. So that was really destabilizing for me, massively destabilizing. So I was okay with that diagnosis because they allowed me to have both. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of times they make the mistake of going, it's one or the other. Yeah. Um, and I mean, maybe it is, you know, I'm not a psychiatrist, but um, I also think that both can coexist because they're very different. One's, one's a, a very chemical imbalance in your brain and the other one's, um, you know, it's really complex PTSD. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I don't really like to call it borderline personality disorder because it's just the way that you develop as a person when you've been like a, a manipulated. Yeah, I really don't like that name for it. I don't think it ex explains anything about what someone with borderline personality disorder actually experiences and why why they have those symptoms. Um, and also the diagnostic manual, like as it is today, it constantly gets updated and disorders that exist today won't exist in the future. They'll, they'll rename them and they'll, they'll group disorders together and they'll change things. So it is just as much as they've decided for now. Um, so I, I think these things have to be, um, you know, really people can become an expert in figuring out their own diagnosis. It's hard too because some a lot of people that have been diagnosed with borderlines, um, and uh, you know, I'm not. I've I've definitely been a destructive borderline at times, but I know when I talk about it online, I get a lot of people saying, "Oh my God, borderlines are you know the most abusive people out. Like they're the ones that have traumatized me." And 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 it's like this whole stigma about it. And it's like, r really, it's just you know, it's 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 developing as an adult from psychological, you know, child abuse or even emotional neglect. And there's lots of different reasons for that. You know, if you grow up with, um, for an example, an authoritarian type parent like I am, you probably grow up being more of like an empathetic type borderline. Now, this is just a theory that I've, I've been working through in my brain. But, you know, if you've been kind of domineered, you're probably going to be more on the... Um, you know, like the, the triggered side where you kind of like react internally and, and, and it makes you feel small. Whereas some people that I, I notice who do kind of act out, it's like they might see their parents and their parents might have given them, you know, everything that they wanted. So it's maybe like the lack of parenting that has made them develop the way that they did. So they are definitely going to respond differently. So you're not re reacting like a borderline, you're really just reacting to, you know, what you did or didn't get as a child. So, you know, the dynamics and relationships are going to be very, very different. Um, you know, so it's like, and, and depending whether, like what type of partner I have, because I swing between both, I swing between like this narcissistic type uh, partner that I probably find when I am in a more confident um, manic phase because I'm probably more aligned with that type of person but then I also have these like really soft sweet and gentle partners that I get when I'm like more depressed and I probably use them as like a little bit of like an ego boost yeah. <laughs> and then I build my self-esteem up and I'm like okay you're boring see you later um, so yeah th there's so much in it so I I really don't like relate to that diagnosis I only use it when I talk about it because um you know other people can find me if they have that diagnosis yeah, I, and I really like how you've you've really pointed out about borderline personality disorder that that disorder 
there's um there's a whole spectrum and also there's a lot of different ways that it can manifest in people and and i love how you're saying you know it, it is just complex trauma you know that actually it's um you know that label just it really doesn't tell people very much about it at all i think even from a medical point of view doctors I, there's a lot of victim blaming even my doctors like even my psychiatrist would be like yeah it's just your fault you know and i think for me it's like things being my fault was such a trigger for me yeah you know so being told like yeah you are the one that's overreacting was such like you know <laughs> that was one of the triggers that i had it was always me it's like no you're the one that's wrong no you're this you're that it's like don't tell me what i think and what i feel <laughs> Yeah, and feeling judged yeah, by um, the experts is uh, is really yeah, makes, makes everything worse. And you're you're there trying to seek help, and and actually you're you're just getting you know, and and, and often um, you know, professionals don't mean to come across that way, but if they just don't have the right skills and right empathy and right life experiences themselves, and and uh, you know, some unfortunately a lot of professionals are not equipped to deal with either borderline personality disorder or, or bipolar but they for many different reasons might be put in the position of trying to treat these people either mm -hmm. they're um they're accepting the referrals because they're they're in private practice and they need the work or they're accepting the referrals because they're in a post where they're just kind of told okay go see this person and like figure it out as as you go along and um i think with with complex um, disorders like bipolar, a lot of experts don't know enough about it. And, and that's, it's so difficult for someone who's in that position to um, be vulnerable and open up only to be really let down. And from your experience, it sounds like that actually you were referred on to the next person like again and again and again. And um, that it, it must have been very difficult for you to then trust the next person and actually still have hope that there might be some good practitioners out there who, can, who really can help you i had to have faith I, you know i decided i couldn't live like this anymore so it was like i either die or i try yeah 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 so you <laughs> you know i, just, I don't really have a choice like you know and at times i just went stuff that i'm just gonna numb myself or you know take drugs or drink or do whatever i need to do but I, I I don't exactly know what it was. You know, at some point I'd be like, all right, you're at, you're gonna die here in this like shitty caravan in this you know someone's backyard that you're living in, or you're gonna get your ass up and 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 reach your like full potential at some point. Like, you know, you're better than this. So there was a lot of uh, internal pep talks. So there is a part of me that doesn't necessarily relate to people who give up like on the first try. You know, because I'm like, you know, they're like, oh, I tried medication once and I didn't like the side effects. I'm like, oh, like how many medications did you try? They're like, oh, it was just the one and I took it for like five days and then I was over it. And I'm like, uh, um, yeah, it's there are a lot of people that give up. And that's my biggest advice is I never give up trying because you never know what you're going to find. Like one diagnosis, I'm not sure if you know that I have, which is um, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Right. So that was one of my like PMDD. Um, that was one of the, the latest, most life-changing diagnoses that I had as well um, a couple of years ago. And that was through mood charting. It made a massive difference to my life because that's where I could finally say and finally show my doctors as well. Like I have these like year long, you know, kind of month long um, mood swings that are clearly a bipolar and, you know, like seasonally kind of triggered. And then I could see, you know, I, I have these, like every 21 days is my menstrual cycle mm -hmm. so it was like every 21 days like clockwork I would be like trying to kill myself yeah <laughs> like the night before my period so it was like the seven to ten days you know it was like I would get the migraine you know I would get extremely suicidal and then I would just wake up the next day with my period like wait what was that about that made no sense that's yeah, it, it again, it would make me into a completely different person. And those are symptoms too, you know, when I'm like, I'm, you know, it, PMDD sort of turns me into this like homicidal, suicidal maniac because I'm irritable, I'm like fatigued, I hate myself, I'm emotional, I want to kill myself, I want to kill anyone that crosses my path. Like it's intense. It's a really, I, I don't, I don't know how to describe it. It turns me into this monster and I can probably relate because I'd say that that's that's what my mother had growing up uh, with her severe mood swings that the we were made fun of her about but um 
Yeah. So for me, that was like another diagnosis that made a lot of sense, but that was also a difficult diagnosis that people didn't understand. You know, I spoke to my, my psychiatrist and she's like, Oh, that's probably not a thing, but I wouldn't know about that because it's a physical health condition. And I'm like, well, it's in the DSM. Now that you have that diagnosis, how have you started to manage it? What kind of things do you do that are helpful for that? I believe in a holistic approach to treatment with a with a uh, like a the WH like a whole approach. Mm-hmm. Um, so I do I do take medication. I take a mood stabilizer for my bipolar, um, and then I do take an antidepressant, which is quite necessary for the PMDD side of things, and and probably also like the borderline side of things. Um, so there's those two things. And then obviously massive amounts of therapy. For me, I prefer like a group therapy or, you know, um, like those therapy programs like CBT and, th- and things like that, because I prefer a bit more of like classroom type lecture style. I prefer to understand the methodology than to just problem solve like step by step. I want to understand the mechanics of everything. So, you know, there's quite a few years of those types of programs Um, that you need to, I think, get under your belt as well to be able to regulate what goes on in your mind and even what's inside your body. Um, But I've done a lot of other like, you know, kinesiology type programs of, you know, trying to release trapped emotions that are in, you know, that are that are trapped inside your body, because an emotion is, you know, it's, it's a physical, it's a process, not so much like a physical state. Mm -hmm. So I think when you realize that, then you can manipulate those processes to change your you know emotional state um so you know quitting smoking was a massive one for me because I did start smoking cigarettes after my mental breakdown I don't think I realized how much the things that I was putting in my body manipulated my brain chemistry um you know nicotine for example depletes your dopamine um then every time I smoked a cigarette I'd have a cup of coffee because I'm looking for that dopamine hit but then again you know you've got caffeine you've got sugar there there um you know, nerve toxins as well. So they're causing heaps of other problems. And I only really became aware of those things when I did get like a chronic level of kind of uh, inflammation and toxicity in my body for years of just not taking care of it, taking medications and, and all that sort of thing. So I've really been hyper aware of things like diet as well. Um, exercise, trying to have a healthy lifestyle, but you're not going to be able to be able to do those things until you get to a certain level of wellness. And that's where I tell people that medication played a massive role for me, because, you know, if you, if you can't get out of bed, then you can't go for a run. I want to really understand your medication journey. Um, Was there a lot of, you know, people say that psychiatric medication is quite dirty, um, a lot of side effects, lots of times when you might have been put on medication that wasn't working very well for you? I don't know if I can say this on your show, but when men talk about side effects, what they mean is sexual dysfunction. When women talk about side effects, what they mean is weight gain. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, honestly, that's, that's, that's what I've noticed with people. Cause they're like, aren't you worried about side effects? I'm like, to be honest, I wouldn't know what a side effect is because it's like, I was so messed up beforehand. Yeah. Like, you know, the side effects are like anxiety, like whatever suicidal thoughts, like there's different lists. And it's like, yeah, that's how I was before. And I'm not like that anymore. Or I'm like only mildly like that. So clearly it's, it's better. Um, You know, looking back, there's probably some parts of my life, like, like, um, as I don't like talking about specific names of medication, but I will talk about uh, Seroquel being on Seroquel, um, the, or, what do they call it? Quintep, quintepin, quintepilin, whatever it is, but it's an antipsychotic. And, um, you know, I, I probably really didn't need to be on that medication. And I was on anywhere from 25 milligrams to like 3000 milligrams at one point, different combinations of slow and long release. And there, I, I think it is responsible for probably destroying a lot of my life. Um, in the sense that I was definitely a different person on that medication. Um, and I don't think I needed to be on, on, on such doses of that, but can that really be avoidable? Like not really because we don't have like a testing system specifically or in Australia anyway, um, that goes, this is the exact medication that you should be on. It's a trial and error process. Yeah. Um, so you know, that is, people kind of have to accept that and they have to have to kind of, you know, be prepared to go through that process of, 
like, yeah, we probably are going to have to try things and change things and tweak things and try other things. And, and that's, um, that's where I guess it's, it's pretty amazing that you've held on to that hope because I think for some people that it makes them kind of a bit scared of going back and trying something different, especially if they've had years and years of certain things not working. Well, I think at one point you have everything to gain and nothing to lose. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, that's, that's where I was at. I was, I, I, my life was over one way or another. Like, you know, I, even if I didn't, uh, you know, kill myself, I was, I wasn't living like my full potential. I had everything. I had a scholarship to law school. I was going to be a lawyer and I was going to take on the world and like be prime minister or do whatever my overachieving mind, you know, wanted to be able to do. And then suddenly I was this completely dysfunctional human being. How many suicide attempts, if any, um, did you have in your life? I guess it depends on what you actually count as a suicide attempt. I've overdosed quite a few times, um, but rarely been hospitalized for it because there's these silent suicides that I don't think a lot of people understand happen because my family would say I've never actually attempted suicide. But, you know, it's like they just haven't known that I've taken a bunch of pills, woke up in the middle of the night, stumbled my way, fallen downstairs, projectile vomited like everywhere, and then just sort of passed out and been delirious for, you know, 24, 48 hours and then come back and just been like, oh, I'm not dead now. <laughs> like... Wow. So I think there are a lot of things like that that happen to people that no one really ever knows about. And, and I do call them kind of silent uh, suicides because they're, they're a silent suicide attempt that isn't dramatic. Um, and there probably are a lot of people walking around like me that no one would ever know that they've, they've had those moments which I think is, is quite common for a lot of people, especially women. For anyone who takes pills, it's really hard to get the right... <laughs> You're, there's a strange thing that happens where your body is like, no, we're not dying. And your body goes into survival mode. And it doesn't matter how much your mind wants to end its life. Your body is sitting there going, there is this poison inside us. And we are going to do whatever we can to get this poison out of us so that we can survive. And, you know, like in those moments, it's weird. You don't have control over those bodily functions that happen to try and keep you surviving and you know I, I am super glad that I'm here and I think using a suicide attempt um, as a way of determining how unwell someone is is quite wrong mm -hmm. you know just because someone has enough courage strength awareness you know whatever it is to rock up to a hospital or to wait and, and make that appointment and hold out until they go to that psychiatrist appointment to be in that psychiatrist appointment, ask for help. And then, you know, the, the amount of times I've actually stormed out of psychiatrist appointments or sat in my car afterwards after begging for help, like to that point where you're at your wits end, you're like, I, I can't live anymore, but I'm going to put my faith in this. Like, I'm going to reach out just one more time. So I'm going to wait for that appointment. I'm going to wait that week, that month, whatever it is for that appointment. And I'm going to get dressed and I'm going to drive and I'm going to get myself to that appointment. I'm going to sit in that appointment. I'm not going to get the answer that I want. And then I'm going to leave that appointment. I'm going to sit in my car. I'm going to cry. And I'm, you know, like, and I'm going to figure out what to do. And I'm just, I'm going to, you know, like it's, it's such a difficult process. And that is what I'm really passionate about raising awareness for is I want people to know what it's like to be mentally ill because I like, I'm currently writing a series called the bipolar Barbie diaries. And it's basically like my, my daily journals that I'm going to publish in like a, you know, it's like a 12 book series where it's like, I don't want a summary. I don't want people to go. I was here and, and, you know, now I'm here. Look at me. It's like, no, you need to know what it's like to sit in a doctor's office and then, you know, wait for 45 minutes for an appointment and then see an appointment and then, you know, either just be given a script and then have to go and wait in line at the chemist and then wait there and then, you know, go back and you take this medication. Then you're vomiting maybe because that medication's upset your stomach because I did have reactions to some of the medications that they put me on. I, I even had lithium poisoning a couple of times, you know, I couldn't walk because I, I had, you know, all of my, um, 
what, what is it that like muscle tension that you get and and all of my joints are like swollen and I felt like I had arthritis and you know all of this stuff people don't know they're like oh but you know you you went to a doctor about your mental health like five years ago like <laughs> you're not better already like clearly you're doing something wrong like you know there is a time limit on grief and there's a time limit on getting help for mental illness it seems in a lot of people's minds as well especially when you do get people that went to the doctor got a pill or or saw a therapist and they're fine complex mental illness can be so different to situational like grief or you know dr phil says this great he's like He's like, so many people go to the doctor because they, you know, their life sucks and, and they feel shitty about it. He's like, if your life is in shambles, like if you're going through a divorce, if you don't have a job and your life is shit, then, and you don't feel shit about it, like then I would be seriously concerned because then you're just in denial and then you're being psychotic. Like if your world is burning and you don't feel bad about it, you know, then there's something seriously like going wrong with you I want people to know what it's like to be me I want them to remember my journey and that's why I blog about it as well in the way that I do because I want them to know what it's like to reach out for help to have that faith and then to have that faith <laughs> crushed yeah. and then to have to find that faith again you know and and deal with those family members and those friends and everyone just being like come on like get your life together and you're like yeah I, no. I think, um, it's really lovely that you're doing that journaling to actually show that, you know, the reality is that it's not about just finding a cure and being fixed. Um, the reality is that we struggle as humans and, um, you know, some people struggle more than others. Some people will, will keep struggling throughout their life. Of course, people can find coping strategies that work very well, but um, if anyone has this, expectation on loved ones to just have this quick fix and they get really impatient and frustrated that they've not gotten better then perhaps they need to do their research and really understand someone's journey so much more so they can understand that actually for certain difficulties there is no quick fix and it's not like go and get six sessions of cbt and then you're you're good you're good for life and um, you touched on relationships and um, i'm really curious about relationships um for you because having having such um complex mental health difficulties and um and you kind of talked about your choice of partners at different times it must have made relationships very difficult for you so like i love the way that you said for me because often when people talk about relationships it's instantly like oh it must have been hard to date you <laughs> like I'm probably one of the, my friends actually say they're like, you're one of the most sane people that we know, um, you know, so it, it's, it's, it's hard to be in a relationship with someone when you're feeling like your own stuff because you have like a filter, you know, and that's the way I see it. Like that's where the name bipolar Barbie came from because I was having like a pretty manic episode my room was a mess. Like I'm talking like I had a foot of clothing or like my whole wardrobe was on my floor. And my housemate said to me, like, I, you know, if you had less clothes, I think you would be less messy. And I was like, yeah, but you know, I just have so many different wardrobes, you know, like I, I have my depressed wardrobe and I have my borderline wardrobe and I have my like revenge body wardrobe. And I, <laughs> like, I've, I've got all of these different, like my manic wardrobe and it's like all of these different things. I was like, I just have so many different personalities. They each need their own wardrobe. Like they have their own set of outfits. And, you know, that's where this name bipolar Barbie came from. Cause I was like, I'm just like a naked Barbie doll, you know, like Barbie, there's Dr. Barbie and like nurse Barbie, wedding Barbie, scuba diving Barbie, roller skating Barbie. And I'm like, I'm like that. I'm depressed Barbie. I'm suicidal Barbie. I'm anxious Barbie. I'm borderline Barbie. I'm manic Barbie. You know, I'm bipolar Barbie. I'm all of the Barbie dolls. And I never really know who I'm going to be each day. I'm, there's, you know, a little girl just decides who Barbie gets to be. Like, what if Barbie doesn't want to get married today? And I, I got married and I'm since separated. And I don't, it was PMDD week when I got married. Mm -hmm. And I were, you know, I was kind of that Barbie doll that was like forced to get married. Um, you know, definitely like, you know, I chose to get married, but it, on at the time when it actually happened, I didn't feel like doing that on the day, but um, 
you know, so it really is about living with these consequences of just all of these different people that you get to be. So it's like, yeah, you're, you're one person when you, when you meet someone, you're, you're one person at this time of the month or, or this time of the year. And, you know, it, it takes on a whole persona. Yeah. Like your, your wants are different. Your needs are different. Your desires are different. And it's, it's hard. It would, I imagine it would be kind of hard to, to date me. Um, it's also, yeah, hard to kind of just never know what you want. So to be compatible with someone is quite difficult. Um, but I think for me, that's where, you know, you talk about the extremes and, and, and like recovery is sort of, of about sandwiching those extremes um, in. things so definitely a lot better now but in saying that as well I have had to create a lifestyle that works for for me yeah. so you know I haven't been hospitalized in a couple of years but I also haven't had a job in a couple of years mm-hmm. so it's like you know if I if I was forced to you know, I've also had a, a stable house. Like I'm currently living in a, in a granny flat at my parents' house, mm-hmm. which is, was a challenging uh, couple of years ex- like as well, but also quite enlightening. Um, you know, a lot of childhood triggers that I had to deal with. So was, that was challenging, but enlightening. Whereas like before that, for the two years before that, I lived in like 16 different houses. Yeah. You know, so for, I've been a lot more stable, but my life has also been more stable. Like you can't expect yourself to have a stable life you know, a stable mind if you don't have a stable life. Um, and it doesn't, it's like a chicken and egg situation. You know, what came first at the end of the day, you've, you've probably got to fix your life because your life is like easier than like your mind. Like you, you have to be in the right mind to make proper choices, but you also have to have a level of stability so that you can build those building blocks. I also haven't been in a relationship in a couple of years now which has been the best thing ever. One, because, you know, I, I needed to be in relationships previously. So therefore they controlled me, you know, nine to five is never going to work for someone that has like a fluctuating, fluctuating uh, capacity to function. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, and, and like when I was working full time, it's like PMDD week would hit, I'd get a migraine and be bedridden with like fatigue and, you know, I'd have to take like a week off work. So I was like constantly taking like time off work just because of that aspect of it, you know, um, which was like super physical. So it's like that was never really going to work for me. Um, I did manage to find a job for a while that was really, really helpful that where I could just be like casual and I could say, you know, when my boss did the roster, he was like, okay, how are you feeling this like this week or this month? Like, you know, what, what do you want? Do you want some more shifts or do you need to like cut back a little bit? Um, because, you know, when I was working full time, I you couldn't take time off to go to a doctor's appointment. Um, what were the positives that you've taken away from all of these struggles that you've been through? Yeah, well, I mean, when I was a kid, I really, you know, I wanted, I wanted to write a book, you know, and I wanted to, uh, so I wanted to be an author. I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to be a fashion designer. You know, I wanted to be a motivational speaker and I wanted to change the world. And, you know, at some point, like those childhood dreams sort of like disappeared because society's like, well, you know, you've got to pick something. So, you know, I, I went off to law school cause they were like, you're smart you're in, you know, you're intelligent, you're a debater, you're too smart to be an artist, you know, you need to have some sort of career. So I went off on that way. And yeah. I had my whole life planned out. And I remember being in the, the psych ward this one visit, and my psychologist said to me, you know, you need to stop thinking about what you've lost, and start focusing on what you've gained. And I'm there going, what on earth could mental illness have given me? It's taken everything away. It's taken my future. It's taken everything I wanted. But then I was really thinking about what what was it that I, I wanted out of my life? And that's when I really thought of these childhood dreams. And then I realized that, you know, my journey has given me everything I ever wanted. It made my art better. You know, it, it made it gave me something to write about. I started writing again because I stopped for, you know, a good 10 years because people told me my writing was crap. And then all of a sudden it's, you know, I'm writing online and, and people are loving it, engaging with it. And, you know, I've created this massive platform and people are telling me that I'm, I'm changing the world and I get, I have something that I'm really passionate about. 
So in a way, having a mental illness kind of gave me everything that I wanted or this journey that I've had to go through because of it. And where can people find more information about you, B? Uh, so Instagram's the underscore bipolar underscore Barbie. Uh, I think Facebook's just the bipolar Barbie. Um, I My YouTube channel is probably one of the coolest places you could follow me. So definitely check out my YouTube channel. It's just bipolar Barbie or my website at bipolarbarbie.com where I post lots of, um, you know, awesome informational videos um, about my journey.